You know, I've done two video reviews now and neither of them have been on NES games. I think it's about time we do something to remedy that, but which one to play? I know, High Speed. That's a game that everybody's heard of and it'll bring in the views by the millions. Let's do it. need something more intense, something with more action, something bionic. Hello and welcome to another Rob's Retro Reviews. This time we're taking a look at an often overlooked NES classic, Bionic Commando. Bionic Commando was developed by Capcom on December 1988 for the NES. Although it came out in October 1990 in Europe, which is almost a whole two years later, Capcom are famous today for the Resident Evil, Monster Hunter and Ace Attorney games, but back in the NES era they were most famous for the Mega Man and Street Fighter series. So where exactly does Bionic Commando fit into all of this? Well, Bionic Commando was based on an arcade game of the same name, which was released in 1987 for America and Japan. But it was never released in Europe. What does the Bionic Commando series have against Europe exactly? The NES version isn't just a port of the arcade game though, and the two versions have very little in common. Really, the only thing that's the same about them is that they both feature a guy running around with a bionic arm. Beyond that, the story is different, the levels are different, the music is different, and practically everything else is different. They just share a name and a premise. The Bionic Commando series was initially brought to my attention by the remake of the NES title, Bionic Commando Rearmed, which was released for Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and PC in 2008. The remake is fantastic, keeping what made the original a hit, and changing a lot of the somewhat dated mechanics of the original NES version. But how does the NES version stand up today? I guess we'll have to pop it in and find out. As with a lot of NES games, if you leave the title screen alone for a while, it'll play a cutscene which gives us an introduction to the game's story. The first thing I find quite unique about Bionic Commando is that the story is being told by an unknown narrator who speaks about events that have taken place in the past. This means that the whole game is actually a flashback, and this narrator is simply reflecting on his experiences. For all we know, this guy's just making everything up and the events of the game don't actually happen. Still, it's an interesting setup, especially for the time. During this introduction, it's explained to us that at some point in the 1980s, there's an ongoing war between two factions called the Federation and the Empire. The leader of the Empire, Generalissimo Kilt, discovers plans for an unfinished weapon called the Albatross, and decides to complete this mysterious weapon and use it to annihilate the Federation. The exact year where Bionic Commando is set is 1980X, meaning that it's actually a prequel to Mega Man, which is set in 2000X. The Federation learn of the Albatross project and send in their best soldier, Super Joe, to not only discover what the weapon is, but also to destroy it. Super Joe just so happens to be the name of the protagonist from a game called Commando, meaning that Bionic Commando isn't just a prequel to Mega Man, but it's also an indirect sequel to Commando. But, Super Joe is quickly captured, which paves the way for the player character, Lad Spencer, to enter enemy territory in order to rescue Super Joe and destroy Project Albatross, taking all the glory for himself. So that's the plot set up out of the way, now I think it's time to get into the game properly, so let's strap in and enjoy the ride. The first thing you'll see is the map screen, which you can explore by moving around it in a grid-like fashion, similar to Super Mario Bros. 3. On this map you can see all of the areas of the game and whether they're enemy bases or neutral areas, and you can also see enemy transport trucks which move around the grid as you move. Luckily we can get to the first area of the game without crashing into any enemy trucks. Bionic Commando is a 2D action platformer. As with most games in that genre, you start off with a simple weapon, in this case a rifle, or normal gun as it's called in the manual. As you progress, you gain access to a much more varied and powerful set of weapons, which allow you to more easily defeat your enemies. 
Where Bionic Commando separates itself from almost every other platformer out there is the fact that Lad Spencer can't jump. Rather than jumping, he uses his bionic arm, hence the title Bionic Commando, to reach out, grab ledgers and swing himself around. He can also use the arm to reach up and grab platforms directly above him and pull himself up. When you get better at the game, and you'll need to get good at this if you want to finish it, you'll be able to string together all kinds of different movements with the bionic arm. You'll need to swing across gaps, grab small sections of the roof and pull yourself to safety all without ever touching the floor, and when you manage to achieve this, it feels really satisfying. I was killed by touching an enemy a single time? Unlike most games, at the start of Bionic Commando there's no visible health bar and getting hit by anything a single time will cost you a 1-up. That isn't to say that if you get hit once the game is over though. The way health works in Bionic Commando is a little bit confusing at first, but when you figure it out it actually makes quite a lot of sense. You start the game with no extra health, so being hit once by any enemy or bullet will lose you a 1-up instantly. If you collect a certain number of bullet items that the enemies drop, you can increase your maximum health, therefore being able to withstand more hits. For each new health upgrade you get, the number of bullet items you'll need to upgrade your health further will increase. Think of it like levelling up in an RPG using experience points. I don't know why this isn't explained in the game or in the manual, it's quite vital information you'll need to fully understand the mechanics of the game, but this isn't too much of an issue because you'll work it out by playing the game for a while anyway. There's also an on-screen indicator of how many bullets you'll need for your next health upgrade, which can be seen on the pause menu, but it's unclear as to what that indicator means unless you already understand the health system. A minor setback, but let's get back into the game. In most games like this, the objective is to simply move from one side of the screen to the other, and there's not much besides enemies stopping you from doing that. In Bionic Commando though, you can't just rush for the end of the level without first accessing these communication rooms. If you try to go for the end of the level without doing this, you'll be greeted by a locked door. In these communication rooms, you can contact HQ, who will give you bits of advice and progress the story further, and you can hack into the enemy communications and learn something about the enemies in the area. They also act as checkpoints, so if you die after visiting one of these rooms, you won't go back to the start of the level. After going through all that, you'll be taught the basics of the bionic arm controls by the game forcing you to use this spotlight to swing across a pit. Generally, the controls are simple. B is the shoot button, A fires your bionic arm, and the D-pad moves you around. Where the controls become a lot more complicated, though, is in the way that you can perform different manoeuvres with the bionic arm. Sure, a jump like this is simple, you just attach the arm and hold the direction you want to go. But, you can perform more advanced techniques by using the D-pad to affect your swinging. For example, you can perform a small jump by grabbing a platform in front of you, starting a swing, and then pressing down, which will swing you forward, but because you retracted the arm quickly, you won't gain a lot of momentum. Another thing you'll need to master is quickly stringing together different types of movement. So you'll need to do a forward swing, then latch onto another platform and swing again, only to have to quickly shoot your arm upwards to raise yourself onto another platform. It takes a little while to get fully used to the arm controls, and it can feel a bit clunky to begin with. But if you stick with it and try different combinations of swings, it will eventually feel natural. And for an NES game, they really captured the sense of momentum well. After completing the first area, you'll be taken back to the level select screen, where you can either visit a neutral area, marked by the colour red, or go to the next proper level. You should always visit the neutral areas first though, because you can find some items you'll need later. This is a neutral area. All acts of violence are prohibited in this area. That's fair enough. If violated, you will be attacked. Whoa, I get the feeling that this guy is prone to violent outbursts. He just waits at the entrance to town, standing there threatening anybody who wants to go shopping. So in this area, the main thing you find is the flare bomb, which can be used to light up area 4, making it a lot easier to traverse through. But the strange thing is, you just walk past the leader of the Empire. You know, the guy that's built up to be the antagonist and the last boss of the game. I would shoot him there and then, but Mr. Passive Aggressive threatened me, so I don't think I dare to try. Seeing as we now have flare bombs and a health potion we got for completing the first level, I think this is a good time to talk about the loadout screen, which appears when you start a level. There are four different types of items you can take into each stage with you. One weapon, one piece of equipment, one protection item, and one communicator. As you play the game, you'll unlock more of these items by completing levels and by exploring neutral areas. Your equipment consists of items which will give you a certain ability while in a level. These items are the flare bombs, which allow you to light up dark areas, energy recovery, which fills your health back up to maximum once per level, 
iron boots, which let you attack enemies by swinging into them, and the rapid fire device, which lets you shoot the normal gun continuously by holding the B button down. You then have your protector gear, which allows you to withstand hits without taking damage. The pendant protects you from one hit, the helmet from two, and the bulletproof vest from every other bullet that hits you, effectively doubling your health. Then there's the communicators, which allow you to access later levels that are blocked off at the start of the game. Think of them as keycards, which unlock the doors to later levels. Finally, there's the weapons, but I'll go into more detail with those later. For now, let's finally start the second level. In this level, you'll learn that you'll have to perform repeated swings by detaching and reattaching to the roof and platforms without touching the floor. To demonstrate this properly, the floor is covered in spikes, and at this point, you'll die in one hit if you touch them. This is where the game gets serious. Something I haven't talked about yet is the boss sections at the end of every level. Some of these are reused throughout the game, which is slightly disappointing. I imagine this was done because of hardware limitations, but there's still quite a few different battles to encounter. A common element of all of these bosses is that you always have to make your way to the end of a room and destroy a computer system, but the opponents in these rooms can be very different. First off, you have a wave defense boss battle where there's a ton of respawning enemies and you have to get past and defend against them. Then you have a guy with a metal arm who will shoot it directly up to try and knock you off of your platform in order to hit you. Then there's a giant robot which will shoot bullets in a three-way spread, as well as moving up and down, so you'll have to avoid its shots while also staying close enough to shoot it back. Finally, there's this guy in a robot suit who will attempt to grab you and hit you, and he can only be hit back by shooting him in his head. These four enemies make up the game's reoccurring bosses, with each new encounter becoming slightly more difficult. The interesting thing with these boss encounters is that you don't actually need to kill the boss. So long as you destroy the computer system at the end of the level, you can complete it with no punishment. I suppose the bosses are there more to get in the way as opposed to actually needing to be defeated. After completing these boss sections, you'll be rewarded with a new item. In our case, because we finished Area 4, which is technically level 2, confusing I know, we got the Wide Cannon, which is essentially a shotgun. Oh my god! If you hit into an enemy truck on the map screen, you'll be taken to a top-down section where the game becomes more of a shooter than a platformer. The objective of these battle areas is to get to the very top of the screen while defeating and avoiding the onslaught of enemies. Using your bionic arm will now spin you around, and this can be used to deflect bullets and knock enemies off balance. You can also now shoot in eight different directions, but so can the enemies, which turns these areas into bullet hell situations where you have to be very careful about how you progress. While I'm not the biggest fan of these sections, every enemy encounter is fundamentally the same, they break up the gameplay and add a lot of variety. They also make the world map more interesting because rather than just mindlessly moving from area to area, you can be more tactical and think about where your enemies will be if you move in a certain direction and try and outmaneuver them. I've seen quite a lot of people say that there aren't continues in Bionic Commando, and while that's true at the start of the game, you can earn continues by playing these top-down enemy encounter sections. In these areas, there will be two enemies, which are different to all the others. They might be in a vehicle, or they might have a bionic arm of their own, but either way, killing these enemies will make them drop an eagle item, which will give you a continue for every one that you collect. You can carry nine continues at a time, and keep collecting them as much as you want. So technically, there's actually unlimited continues, seeing as the trucks constantly respawn. Anyway, let's get on with the game and go to the next level. The next few levels are interesting because they all throw different obstacles in your way. Area 2 sees you going through a sewer in which blobs of goo seep out of the pipes and upon touching them they trap you and move you across the floor, dragging you into bottomless pits. The only way of avoiding this is to use your bionic arm to pull yourself free of the blob's grasp, but to do this, you'll need to have good timing and to remain calm. A common element in all of the bionic commando levels seems to be that panicking results in death. Then, you can go to Area 5, which is one of my favourite levels. In this stage, you you progress the level by moving up rather than left or right, but as you move up, more and more enemies will come after you, and these enemies can be particularly difficult to get around. The most annoying are these helicopter pack soldiers who can shoot electric beams down to hit anyone who stands under them, but as annoying as they are, it's always satisfying to quickly get around them and defeat them before they have a chance to get in your way. Also, this stage features my favourite music in the game, called Albatross Towers. All the music in Bionic Commando is great, but this track in particular is more foreboding and threatening than the others, and it makes the climb up the level even more tense. Bionic Commando has some really catchy and perfectly fitting music. From the tense map screen to the in-stage combat themes, it's all good. It's not as great as, say, Castlevania's music, but it's up there. 
Not only is this level great because of the unique level design and the awesome music, but after you defeat the boss of the area, you get the rocket launcher. I guess now is as good a time as any to talk about the different weapons in Bionic Commando. I've already mentioned the normal gun, which shoots in a straight line in the direction you're facing, and the wide cannon, which doesn't have good range, but as well as shooting straight forward it also shoots diagonally up and down. But then, there's also the rocket launcher, three-way cannon and the machine gun. The three-way cannon is similar to the wide cannon, but it has good range, and rather than shooting diagonally up and down, it shoots straight up and straight down. The machine gun shoots quickly but is less accurate than the normal gun. And finally, we have the rocket launcher, which is the only weapon you need to use in the entire game after unlocking it. I see what they were trying to do with the weapons, it was a sort of Doom-esque way of balancing them, where there was always a drawback to using a certain weapon, while there's always something better about it compared to all the others too. There's not really any particular drawback to using the rocket launcher. Its rate of fire is bad, but you one hit almost every enemy in the game with it, so you don't need a good rate of fire anyway. Once you've got the rocket launcher, there's no need to ever look back. Next we go to Area 3, which is a more natural themed level when compared to the sewers, military bases and construction sites in the previous levels. This one takes place on a mountain, and rather than soldiers shooting you, there will be spiders, moths and man-eating plants that will kill you in one hit. These enemies have no context in the story, which is a bit weird, but hey, at least it keeps things interesting. There's also new obstacles to traverse in the form of quicksand, which will drag you down and kill you if you aren't quick enough to escape it. Later in the level is one of the hardest jumps in the entire game, where you need to grab small pillars hanging from the ceiling and swing your way across a pit of spikes. With the pillars being so thin, it's easy to miss the shot with your bionic arm, and could result in the loss of many lives. I think I've avoided the subject long enough now, let's talk about these graphics. Bionic Commando features some amazing graphics. Honestly, these are some of the most varied, colourful and interesting visuals I've ever seen in an NES game. Almost every level features a different theme, the background's detailed, character sprites are well animated, in particular lad swinging animation is great, and every section of the game feels unique. There's really nothing to criticise here. I wanted to keep playing it just so I could see what else the game had in store for me visually, it really is fantastic. Next we've got Area 6, and this is where the game decides to kick things up a notch. This is easily the most difficult section of the entire game. Partway through the first section of the level you have some complicated swinging and grabbing to perform to make it across huge bottomless pits, all while avoiding the constant barrage of soldiers being airdropped into the battlefield. Then, if you make it past this, you have even more complicated jumps, followed by a Donkey Kong inspired obstacle course, where you have to avoid barrels by hanging onto the ceiling while constantly moving forward. And trust me when I say, this part is hard. Ah! This section may have killed me over and over again, but I eventually learned every pattern and I can now avoid every obstacle with the right timing absolutely perfectly. One of the things I love about NES games is that they're difficult and they'll require you to play the same sections of levels over and over again, but once you've mastered those sections and you replay them and pull them off perfectly, the feeling of satisfaction is incredible. I suppose that's why people consider NES games to be so replayable. They were designed to be that way. Next we have Area 8, which is the most maze-like level in the whole game. I found my way through by getting lucky and I'm still not sure what the optimal route to get to the exit is, but nevertheless, I did it. After all that, I think it's time to relax. Let's head over to Area 19. It's a neutral area, so it should be a good place to take a break and find some upgrades. <laughs> This is supposed to be a friendly area, and here I am getting stabbed up. If I was to do that, the soldiers would be all over me. But no, this guy's free to slice whoever he wants with no repercussions. Well, I'm having none of it. I'm taking the law into my own hands. What? So I'm not even allowed to defend myself? What kind of corrupt system is this? You know what makes it even worse? Is that there's absolutely no reason to explore this area. There's no items and no upgrades. And even worse than that is that you're going to bump into two or more trucks to get here. It's just a massive kick in the teeth. 
Area 9 features these annoying enemies who move up and down with bionic backpacks to avoid your bullets. If you shoot normally, they'll move up, and if you use your bionic arm to pull yourself up and shoot above them, they'll go back down. The best strategy for beating them is to shoot as you pull yourself up to hit them as they move down. Other than that, you have this mine cart section where you'll need to swing across while avoiding the carts above you and on the same level as you. Area 7 can now be unlocked by destroying a wall using the weapon you get from Area 9. And this level is fairly straightforward until you get to this bit where I couldn't tell that this red platform wasn't a part of the background. Seriously, they could have made this a bit more obvious. But straight after you're attacked by these two helicopters which constantly respawn and they will hunt you down forever until you make it across this gap. They don't make it easy to do that though because they'll be shooting at you at all times. This is where you finally find Super Joe. You remember him? The guy that you were sent to rescue at the start of the game. Well, regardless, you break him out and he apologises for causing so much trouble. What a nice guy. He then tells you that the person who knows how to complete Project Albatross is actually dead. So the Empire are working to resurrect this person and work together to build the weapon. The name of the person they're trying to resurrect? Master D. Seriously? The guy that threatens to destroy the Federation, the major antagonist of the game and the guy that you're going to fight in the final boss battle is called Master D? Okay then. Super Joe heads off to Area 12 where the Empire's HQ is based and tells you to get a special weapon from Area 18, but screw that because we have the rocket launcher. So, after destroying a previously indestructible wall in Area 15, using the weapon that we got from Area 9 earlier in the game, we gain the necessary item to get to the last three areas. Area 10 is the first of the last levels, and it isn't too difficult, but at this point you'll have mastered the bionic arm and you'll be able to speed through this section. A clever little bit of level design is where you need to use the goo, which returns from all the way back in Area 2, to crouch and move under some spikes which are too low to simply walk past. Then you'll have to swing and attach yourself to the ceiling above a pit of spikes and detach yourself at just the right time to land on a platform which is moving left and right directly below you. I like this because there's no other part of the game where you have to do this. Even all the way at the end of the game they're still finding new ways to make you use the bionic arm. Did you know that if you use the rocket launcher against the flying robot boss that you can destroy it in one hit? I told you the rocket launcher was the best, didn't I? What can I say about Area 11? Well it's damn well difficult, that's for sure. Yeah, it's not as hard as Area 6, but it comes very close. The main reason it's so hard is because of this section where you need to perform four successive bionic arm swings without touching the floor, but the timing needs to be absolutely spot on, and if you fall, you need to do a large portion of the level all over again. It's torture. But get past this, and that must be the end of the level, right? No. After all this trouble, you need to perform yet another two perfect swings, otherwise you'll fall straight into a fire pit and die. Now that's harsh. We're finally at the final level, now let's see what waits for us at the end of this long and arduous journey. This level is actually quite a bit different to the others. Here you'll be given the objective of destroying two power generators to open up the next sections of the level. It's interesting and it makes the last level feel more like a military mission than the other levels. I like it. So after destroying the generators and moving through this huge enemy fortress, we're here. The final boss. You walk into a room, and you're confronted by Generalissimo Kilt. He informs you that he's completed Project Albatross without the help of Master D. He then goes to turn the revival machine off so Master D won't wake up, but just as he flicks off the switch... So it turns out that the last boss in Bionic Commando is actually none other than Hitler. I bet you didn't see that coming. While he's never referred to directly as being Hitler in Bionic Commando, in the Japanese version of the game, he's just straight up Hitler. The game even features Nazi imagery in most of its levels, and it's not even called Bionic Commando. It's called Hitler's Revival, top secret. I think I can see now why Bionic Commando wasn't featured on the NES Mini. Obviously, all of this was edited out of the international releases, but still, there's no hiding the fact that this is supposed to be Hitler. I mean, just look at him. Anyway, after that bombshell, we can enter the final boss fight. 
You have to destroy an airship by performing a complicated series of bionic arm swings and shooting the flashing power core. It's actually quite difficult to do this and it can be quite a challenging boss, but its attacks are fairly easy to avoid, so you shouldn't have too much trouble. After destroying the ship, Hitler, oh, I mean Master D, runs away, so you go after him to put an end to all of his evil plans. Next up is one of the best sections of the game. You have to swing off a ledge and free fall into a huge pit but as you fall, you need to shoot a rocket through the windshield of a helicopter that Master D is trying to escape in. Hell yeah, it feels really good to pull that off. But what happens next is one of the most brutal things you'll ever see in a licensed NES game. You literally blow Hitler's head off with a rocket launcher in a licensed NES game. And it's not cartoony. You see bone and blood just fly out of his broken skull. You even see his eye pop out of its socket. Things have gotten pretty intense, but it's not over yet. Now, we have a Metroid-style timer counting down, and we have to escape the facility before it self-destructs in 60 seconds. Not only that, but you have to defeat the hardest of the standard area bosses in order to keep moving up. Come on. I can do this. <laughs> After you escape the base, Lad remembers that Super Joe is still inside. He runs back in to rescue him, and uses his bionic arm to attach himself and Super Joe to the rescue helicopter just before the base explodes. The end cutscene shows us that the mysterious narrator from the start of the game is actually Super Joe, reflecting on his kidnapping and rescue by Lad Spencer. It's a very nice way to wrap things up. But wait, now it's saying the game is set in 1989? I thought it was set in 1980X. I guess, maybe Bionic Commando isn't a prequel to Mega Man after all. In a post credit sequence, we see that Super Joe is telling the story in 2010. Wouldn't it be cool if that was the exact date when the reboot came out? But no, the reboot came out in 2009. They couldn't have just waited a little bit longer? Well, surely Bionic Commando Rearmed 2 came out in 2010 then. Damn it, Capcom! Bionic Commando is one of my favourite games for the NES, it really should be held in higher regard than it actually is. I wish it was featured on the NES Mini, but at the same time with the references to Hitler, Nazis, and the head explosion at the end, I can see why it was omitted. Regardless, I would say it's an absolute must-have for the system. Perhaps my favourite thing about Bionic Commando is how every single one of its levels stands apart from the others. Visually, they all look different and feature different enemies, but also the way the levels themselves are designed also makes them unique. This along with the originality in the bionic arm movement, emphasis on the story development, the huge amount of customization, and the awesome music, make this game deserve a 9 out of 10. Don't get me wrong, it isn't without its flaws. The boss battles are a bit repetitive and uninteresting, and the weapon balancing is poor. But beyond those two points, the rest of the game is amazing. If you don't have an NES, you could get Bionic Commando Rearmed, which is the 2008 remake of Bionic Commando which updates a few things from the original, and adds a two-player mode, difficulty settings, a new hacking minigame, and challenge rooms. It's definitely worth checking out if you like the original, or if you like the look of it, but don't have an NES to play it on. What more's left to say? Bionic Commando is awesome. If you're a fan of platformers or shoot-em-ups, you should definitely give it a go. Thanks for watching my review of Bionic Commando on the NES. If you want to watch more reviews, you can click the videos on screen now. Let me know what you thought to my review in the comments. I'm always looking to improve my videos, so any feedback really helps. Also, if you enjoyed the video, give it a like and subscribe if you want to see more. See you later, everyone.